I would now like to hand the floor to Dr. Diane Julius. Dr. Julius, please. Thank you very much, and uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I think this really is the, the highlight of our evening. We've been waiting for this time when we would have the opportunity to ask some of our own questions uh, to a person who's more capable of answering those questions than, uh, than I suspect anyone else we can think of. Uh, it's, it's my great pleasure and privilege to moderate this, this dialogue, uh, and I thought perhaps I should start with a couple of uh, big picture questions of the sort that uh, our dialogues uh, both today and, and tomorrow, the round tables, are going to be thinking about, and then um, we'll invite you to take it in whatever direction you'd like. I know I have seen that... Uh, whatever direction the audience knows. <laughs> Indeed. Well, I, uh, so someone pointed me to one of your appearances on YouTube uh, and I was amazed at the uh, variety of questions uh, that were thrown at you, but also at the uh, unexpected answers you sometimes gave. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I suppose the question that I would start with uh, is the, the dominant theme that seems to be driving much of our geopolitical discussions these days is the shift in economic power uh, from west to east. Uh, I think most of us felt this was a natural and indeed uh, a positive shift as countries became richer, provided it was gradual and didn't upset too many of us in, in the process. But now with the global financial crisis, many of the countries in Europe, in the United States, in North America, uh, are perhaps facing a very long period of very low growth, while China and other countries in Asia uh, continue to grow healthily. And I think this raises the question of how will the world look in a decade uh, and what challenges do, do you see, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, for both East and West as this shift accelerates? No, the shift is inevitable because of the numbers of population. <clears throat> it doesn't mean that because China's GDP and India's GDP exceeds that of the U.S., <clears throat> that they are necessarily stronger. I mean, they've got more resources at their command. They can field uh, larger armed forces, larger navies. But the fact remains that per capita, the U.S. is still very far ahead. And then technology is also very far ahead. But if it happens too rapidly, uh, the Chinese may make a miscalculation. They may become more assertive and pushy which would be contrary to their long-term interest, which is to win over the countries, the smaller countries in the south, onto their side. So they face a contradiction there. Mm -hmm. So the speed is a, is a difficulty in, in your Well, opinion. the speed is one of the factors which may make them more assertive than it would otherwise be, because the trend, the long-term trend is inevitable sheer numbers and they're going to catch up and it'll go back to what it was 200 years ago when India and China together combined was about 50 to 60 percent of the world GDP mm. and, this, and this assertiveness uh, in China I think this is another area that I know the conference uh, here has been exploring there's a lot of nervousness about China's growing military spending and uh, ambitions, especially on the naval side. Uh, if it's the case that American presence in the Pacific gets scaled down because of the U.S. budgetary problems and also because of the political um, dissatisfaction with the Iraq and the Afghanistan uh, involvement. If the U.S. gradually scales down its presence in the Pacific, do you see this creating difficulties for Japan, South Korea, uh, the other uh, non-Chinese countries in this area? Inevitably, because the whole of all of them combined, <clears throat> Japan, South Korea, India, the whole of ASEAN can't balance China. Mm. 
Without the U.S., the balance is not maintainable. Will there be an arms race in, in Asia then? Well, an arms race in which we, uh, the smaller countries must lose. Hmm. So it would all depend on China's aggression or lack of it, if, if we come to that. Well, I'm not sure it's aggression as such. It's dominance more than aggression. Hmm. Uh, Swenson says the art of war is to win it without going to war. <laughs> yes. And maybe that's what, uh, what is happening with, with Taiwan in this long era. Inevitably. Uh, how, how do you see that playing out? Can you, can you foresee the situation <clears throat> there? I don't want to sound apo uh, apo a apocalyptic, but I don't see Taiwan being able to resist the pull of the mainland with or without American help. There will come a time when the Seventh Fleet cannot intervene because of Chinese aircraft carriers, and China has always considered Taiwan a part of China, and they want China to be reunified. The fact that Taiwan was independent from 1989 <coughs> till the present doesn't make any difference in the long history of China. Mm. Yes, I'm reminded of uh, Henry Kissinger's uh, book that uh, I know I've only recently read, and, and I know you know him very well, uh, when he was relating the history of discussions about Taiwan uh, with Mao, with Zhou Enlai, with a series of leaders, the view from the Chinese side was, we can wait, but eventually we'll be reunited. Oh, yes, of course. It's, it is an, a fixed and immovable objective. <laughs> Gives us all pause for thought. Perhaps I can give uh, the audience a, a chance to ask a few questions. Uh, I think there are some microphones roving around. If, uh, if you raise your hand, someone will find you. And, and perhaps you could, could stand and uh, give us your name and uh, background or where you're from uh, as, as you ask a question. There's a gentleman, yes, right here. Yeah, Mr. Millis, a mentor. It's a great honor and pleasure, as always, uh, to meet you. I'm Sergei Karagana from Russia. Now, I've never heard your views on the future of nuclear weapons in the world. Uh, we have uh, started a discussion during our conference on whether it's a positive or a negative uh, feature of the future world, where they should be eliminated or they should proliferate under control. What is uh, basically your views, not only as a um, politician, but as a philosopher of strategic thinking? Nuclear weapons between big powers, I think, is a plus because it stops major wars. <clears throat> the proliferation of the middle and smaller powers adds a high risk of conflict because their long-term planners may act, rash, may act rashly and the world may come to grief. You imagine, I mean, not just Iran, but every Gulf state, Egypt, and even the <clears throat> smaller states in Africa have got nuclear weapons. For the big states, it freezes the world the configuration, political influence as it is. For the small states, it's a very high risk problem for the world. <laughs>